what I wanted to discuss today, or at least enlighten um, some, is how the Genetic Center how we go through the clinical diagnosis of developmental disorders by using chromosomal microarrays. Um, first of all, I had to give you a bird's eye view of the Greenwood Genetic Campus. We uh, work, we are very spoiled here. The diagnostic laboratories make up the uh, second floor of this building. When we moved into the building 10 years ago, um, the array lab had already grown too big for this space. So we, are over here behind the trees uh, across the street. And here are a couple, here's a picture of our um, wash stations and the carousel for our scanner that we use for uh, the Cytoscan DX platform. So what do we do in a cytogenomics laboratory? We look at the genome from a very global view. We look for abnormalities in the number or structure of chromosomes. We look for aneuploidies, so extra or lost chromosomes, deletions, duplications, translocations, inversions. All of these things can cause imbalances in genes and the gene products, and you get abnormalities. We do this with samples from patients with birth defects, developmental delay. Um, ID, fetal anomalies, miscarriages, growth problems, and then obviously also cancers. When we started this chromosome analysis, you can see a karyotype here in the lower right. Each chromosome has its own unique banding pattern, and you can relate that to or equate that to a barcode. And if the barcode is wrong, then you're going to have some sort of imbalance in the chromosome. If you look at this third set of chromosomes here, this is chromosome three. This is a normal one on the left. And you can see the top has a, has a hat. And the other one on the right does not have a hat. So this particular pair, we have a deletion of the P arm, the end of the P arm of chromosome three. One of the nice things about moving from chromosomes to microarray is that for chromosomes, we have to have living cells. We have to have cells in division. When we're doing microarray, we can use DNA from saliva and DNA from uh, blood is usually where most of our samples come from. This is a, uh, a timeline of the growth of cytogenetics to cytogenomics over the years. Um, really what I wanted to point out here was in the mid 80s, we were um, able to use fluorescence in situ hybridization in the clinical laboratories for the first time. And this was the first time that molecular techniques were combined with cytogenetics. So in this case, we had a particular piece of DNA that was uh, that we had labeled with a fluorochrome. We knew where it belonged in a normal karyotype, and we could use that probe to find uh, deletions and duplications, or if a particular region of a chromosome had been moved somewhere else. In 2002 to 2004, uh, some laboratories started using microarray. And again, this is clinical laboratories started using microarray. Um, at the Genetic Center, we started doing clinical microarrays in 2004. Um, this is actually not a picture of one of those very early microarrays, but our very earliest microarray had 287 probes that covered the entire genome. So each arm of a chromosome had two or three probes. Now, the uh, Cytoscan DX has 2.7 million probes across the entire genome. So you can see what a difference in resolution. When I look at some of the data from some of these earlier arrays, I get even more gray hair than what I already have to think that we used to call out clinical diagnoses based on so few probes. Uh, by 2010, the American College of Medical Genetics and ISCA recommended replacing karyotypes uh, and our dear chromosomes, remember I've been doing this a long time, um, with chromosomal microarrays. And then followed up in 2012 with recommendations for 
the design of an array, the analysis of an array, and how it should perform. By 2014, this is the first FDA clearance of a microarray. And uh, this, of course, was Cytoscan DX, not Thermo Fisher at that point. Um, here at the Genetic Center, we were very, very lucky to be involved with the FDA clearance for uh, Cytoscan DX along with a couple other laboratories. And then last November, the ACMG and ClinGen came out with recommendations for the technical standards for CNV interpretation, which uh, here at the Genetic Center we are still working through. So uh, one of the most um, significant things about the development of microarray and, the, and how it's gotten higher and higher resolution is the difference in resolution. So we have, when we start looking at routine chromosomes, the resolution of that is 5 to 10 megabases, depending on where the deletion or the duplication is. Um, that could be hundreds of genes. And it's not going to be terribly specific uh, in terms of where in the genome are the breakpoints. If you move to high resolution chromosomes, and here we're talking at the 1,000 to, to, to 1,200 band level, um, we're talking a little bit of an increase in resolution, but not a whole lot, so three to five megabases. And again, some of the, the deletions and duplications have to be in the right place in order to see. Um, and there needs to be bands there that you can use. Fluorescence in situ hybridization um, increases your resolution by at least a magnitude. You can get down to 100 kilobases, but that is probably at the lower end for a clinical laboratory. Most of these probes are actually bigger than 100 kb. Uh, and if you get too much smaller, you start having problems seeing the signals. And then we come to microarray. Um, you have comparative genomic hybridization. We'll talk about that in a minute, as well as SNP arrays. And depending on the resolution, depending on the position of the probes, you can get down to uh, 10KB uh, in resolution there, although uh, generally speaking, we usually say uh, 40 to 50 KB. So types of genomic microarrays that are currently being used in clinical labs, uh, you have your oligo arrays. So these are usually about 60 uh, probes that are about 60 base pairs in length that are built up on a slide. Uh, they usually have 44,000 to a million probes per slide. These are copy number only. Then you have your SNP arrays. These are uh, clusters of 24 base pair uh, length probes that have a single nucleotide polymorphism in the middle um, so that uh, you can get allele calls from these. And these run in the 250,000 to 2 million SNPs per chip. And then there are a couple companies that have come out with combination of your copy number uh, probes along with SNPs so that you can get both allele calls and copy numbers. But the resolution of these is uh, much lower in the uh, 100,000 oligos and 100,000 SNPs range. So the resolution of an array can be determined by a number of different factors, um, including, obviously, I think the first one is going to be the number of probes present on the array. Obviously, the companies are not going to put a whole lot of probes in regions that are not of interest. So the higher the, res the higher the number of probes, the probably the higher the resolution. The spacing between the probes is also important. Most of uh, the clinical arrays have a backbone where there is a probe every certain number of base pairs. 
so that you can try to get to the closest breakpoint, even if you're not in the middle of a gene. So for instance, Cytoscan DX has a backbone probe every uh, 1,700 base pairs. And then there's our regions of interest. Um, obviously, cytogenetics has a number of cytogenetic syndromes. We are going to be interested in those regions more than other regions. We're going to be interested in genes, especially genes with a clinical significance. So there, those genes will have coverage. Uh, some, actually most of the arrays have replicate probes. So that increases the confidence of our call if you have replicates and you don't have to um, look at just one probe being a call. Um, I know some arrays have uh, three replicates, some have 15. Um, some, some don't actually even talk about how many copies of replicates they have, just saying that there are multiples. Um, some arrays like the Cytoscan DX have both copy number and SNP probes covering the entire genome. So you can use both of those types of probes for more confidence in your call. And then laboratories actually have, uh, are able to, um, in some cases anyway, determine the number of probes that they use in order to make a call. Um, I believe that the FDA does not allow us to change those um, in the software that we have, but I know that some software will allow you to change this. So for instance, if you say you want to only use three probes to make a call, you're going to get lots and lots and lots of calls on that particular patient. If you say, no, I want to only look at calls where there are 10 probes, making the call, then you're going to increase the confidence in the call, but you're also going to decrease the number of calls that you have. Hopefully that makes sense. So the diagnostic utility that we here at the Genetic Center have found over the years by doing um, cytogenomic microarray testing. And again, we just talked about this conventional cytogenetics of eight to 10 megabases for your standard chromosome analysis is probably about as good as you're gonna get. This, this region could cover hundreds of genes. Uh, genomic microarray, it's gonna be less than 50,000 base pairs to the point that, as in this particular case, you can, act we actually picked up a single exon loss within the MBD5 gene. So what about comparative yields? Uh, with G-banded karyotyping, we were finding about a 4% uh, detection of abnormalities. At one point, we were doing subtelomere fish analysis where we had pr different probes for the subtelomere region of every chromosome, and both the P and the Q arm. And that added about 3% of our detection. And so I would say for G-band and fish, we had about a 7% uh, detection. When we moved to targeted microarrays, we had between seven and 11% um, detection. And now that we're using whole genome analysis, we're at 18 to 23% diagnostic yield. So let's just briefly look at the chip technology. So, um, you understand what the differences are that I'm talking about. We have uh, the comparative genomic hybridization technology where you have a patient sample that is labeled in this particular case in green. You have a control sample that is labeled in red. You mix these two and hybridize them to the chip, wash away uh, any excess, and then scan an image. And basically what you get is here on the right. If you have a gain in the patient, that means you have extra green signal, you're going to see green signal on the array. If you have a deletion in the patient, that means you have less green signal. So you're going to see red on the array. 
So that would equate to a loss. For uh, Cytoscan DX versus an array CGH DX, what are some of the differences? Again, with the array CGH DX, we have two different uh, samples that have to be, and two different colors that have to be used. Most of these arrays use uh, cyan dyes. They are ozone sensitive. So you have to be cons considerate of ozone and uh, fluorescent uh, degrading. These are copy number only. And so they have a lower density of probes. And they're going to require separate confirmation technologies for the actual proband. With Cytoscan DX, um, we have the added value of SNPs. You also have the fact that it, this is a single color, uh, an array, so only the patient DNA is labeled and hybridized to the chip. The fluorescent intensity from that is um, compared to an in silico reference that's based on more than 300 normal individuals and cell lines. This technology uses phycoerythrin, uh, which is not ozone sensitive, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and ozone is a big problem in the South, um, not necessarily everywhere, but definitely in the South. Um, copy number probes and SNP probes, both in this particular case, covering the same genome or covering the entire genome. So you can use both copy number and SNP probes in order to confirm your calls. And together you have 2.7 million probes. What I really like is that when you have an allele call, the they do an independent confirmation of your copy number findings. And they also help with breakpoint determination, which means at least for the proband, you don't have to do another confirmation study. Um, this slide, and we're actually not going to go over this, so breathe a deep sigh of relief. Um, this, For those of you who are interested in the specifics about the Cytoscan DX, they are all here. What I wanted to point out, we have one marker per 1700 as the backbone, and we have complete coverage of the ISCA constitutional genes. There is also complete coverage of cancer genes, uh, as well as the X chromosome. This is a two-day workflow. Uh, here at the Genetic Center, we run about 1,500 arrays a year. Um, we do usually at least one, if not two, runs of gene or of uh, Cytoscan DX a week. Um, usually the same tech, but sometimes we have different techs. Uh, running the first versus the second. So what are the basic principles of um, the SNP microarray? We have here your gene, whole genome in black. Where the probes have been picked are here in the green rectangles, um, which are then placed on uh, multiple copies of each are placed on the chip. We have DNA isolated from our patient. We label those with fluorochrome and then allow those to hybridize on the chip. The excess is washed away and the scanner then looks for the intensity of the fluorescence on the chip. If there's a gain, we have lots of fluorescence. That tells us there's a gain. So you can see we have some very, very bright uh, dots on here. If there's a loss in the patient, that means we have less fluorescence because there's less DNA with probe, and that equates to a loss of that region. Here's a snapshot of um, a deletion from the software. Again, the software will tell us there's a, an aberration call. In this case, it's in red with an arrow pointing down telling us it's a deletion. We always like to look at the log two ratio. Log two ratio should be at zero for two normal copies. In this case, there's also a deletion here where the log two is going to drop to 0 0.5. Uh, we have 
software again will tell us copy number state. So we are at two, we drop down to one, go back to two. What I love about this is the allele calls. Uh, so for each SNP, the SNP is picked because uh, about 50% of the population will be type, will have sequence A, and about 50% of the population will have sequence B. So a good number of us will be heterozygotes, um, but even if not, if you uh, denature these SNP probes and allow them to rehybridize, we're going to get AA together, AB together, or BB together. So we're going to get three um, allele tracks where you have two normal copies. Where there's a deletion, again, think about this, we have only one chromosome or one region of that genome, not two as in a normal state. So you're only going to have an A version or a B version. So we get uh, this just two allele tracks. Uh, down here, these are the genes. This is the OMIM gene track. Uh, if you were to spread it out, you could actually read the name of the gene. And then I like to personally have uh, an allele, or sorry, the ideogram of the chromosome across the bottom. A lot of this is changeable uh, in the software. If you have a gain, again, we have the log two ratio where you're at zero if there's two copies. If you have a gain, we go up to 0 0.5 and then come back down. Copy number state, again, we're at two. In this case, we went up and actually a little bit over three came back down. And here again are Leo calls. Normal two copy, we expect to three, see three allele tracks. Where you have an additional chromosome, and in this case you're going to have three chrom um, chromosomes, you end up with an additional allele track. So four allele tracks for AAA, AAB, ABB, BBB. Um, the OMIMS and the uh, chromosomes down there. Of course, the, the really the additional power of our alleles, of our SNP arrays, are the fact that we can see loss of heterozygosity, uniparental disomy, uh, what else do we want to call it? Absence of heterozygosity, where uh, we have identical strands of chromosome um, on both copies. So again, in this particular case, the whole chromosome is at two copy numbers. The, uh, and you can see that here, copy number state is at two all the way across, so that's normal. But what we're seeing on the allele track here is that there are only two allele tracks. We don't have the three allele tracks that we expect uh, from a normal call. What this is telling us is that we have two chromosomes and at least at the SNP level, they are identical. Uh, this big green square across here is the software telling us that we have large regions of loss of heterozygosity. So if we have regions of loss of heterozygosity or uniparental disomy in this case, what that raises the suspicion of is a recessive condition. Or if we're talking about a chromosome that has imprinting, you need to be concerned about imprinting disorders. This happens to be chromosome 16 and was from a uh, pregnancy loss. Um, here we have uh, a very simplified version of the GGC uh, uh, basic algorithm of what we do with testing for individual patients that come in with unexplained developmental delay, uh, intellectual disability, multiple congenital anomalies, and autism spectrum disorder. So for those patients that fall into this category and that falls into the FDA clearance for Cytoscan DX, um, we do the microarray. If we get a pathogenic result, that's really the end, other than we're, we're going to look at parents. Um, if we get a variant of uncertain significance, we immediately recommend that we need to look at parents because if one of them has the same variant of uncertain significance, it reduces the likelihood that that variant is 
uh, causative of the problems in the patient. Not necessarily excludes it, but definitely reduces the risk. Um, if it's de novo, that increases the possibility that this may be causative. If we get a normal result from array, we then recommend whole exome sequencing um, or whole genome sequencing, uh, as the case may be. Those patients that have only seizures or come in with only autism spectrum disorder, these are uh, not, uh, they don't fall into the FDA category and we actually run a different array for those patients. Um, then uh, we also have, we also run a very high resolution del dupe microarray uh, in special cases from whole exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing. So now we're getting to the fun part. This is the uh, microdeletion, some of the cases that we've seen. Um, I'm going to start off with a real easy one. This is just a simple microdeletion. Um, this little guy is a four-month-old male. He came in because of his microcephaly. We ran the microarray, and you can see down here that we have a 1.8 megabase loss of 1Q to 1.1 to Q21.2. The 1Q21.1 microdeletion syndrome is one of a multitude of microdeletion, microduplication syndrome regions that have been reported since uh, the la in the last 10 years since we most cytolabs started using microarrays. Uh, this deletion syndrome has a highly variable phenotype. Some are asymptomatic carriers. Some have severe developmental delay, some are moderate. Uh, most have microcephaly or relative microcephaly, as our little guy does. But then there are other, um, other abnormalities that go along. So one of the things that his physician is going to need to watch for is the development of seizures and cataracts. Um, confirmation of microarray by conventional cytogenetic methodologies, uh, especially those of us that are old school, um, still like to do chromosomes on occasion, actually all the time, but you know, microarrays are fun too. Here we have a young lady that has developmental delay. She is nonverbal. She has a bicuspid aortic valve, seizures. She's farsighted. Uh, you can see that she has a interesting looking nose. She has a broad mouth. She also has joint swelling and hyper, is hypermobile uh, joints, mobile fingers, sorry. Um, when we ran the microarray, I think you can see this down here, although it is quite small. Um, she has not a one copy gain, but a two copy gain of this region of chromosome 13. This is Q13.1 to Q14.3. And this was not seen in either parent. So it's de novo. We wanted to know, uh, I mean, this is obviously a, a problem, but we wanted to know uh, how this duplication is there. Is it in tandem? Do we have an extra copy of this um, right down the, the chromosome? Or are these pieces of DNA, have they been inserted into a different chromosome? So we ran chromosome analysis, and even though this is very small, I think you can see that this chromosome 13 is quite a bit longer than the normal one. So we have uh, extra material on a chromosome 13, but how is it placed? So we went ahead and we did a paint of chromosome 13, which is in red, and then we used a specific probe for the retinoblastoma gene, which is actually here within the duplicated region. Here is our no normal chromosome 13 with the retinoblastoma gene here. And here's our abnormal one. And most likely what we have going on here is we have a normal 13 through retinoblastoma. And then we have a duplication of this region, so a tandem duplication, with the next copy of retinoblastoma right here. And then we have an inverted copy of this region following at the bottom of the chromosome. 
So here we have a very interesting case where we found an incidental finding uh, while doing the microarray. This is an infant with hypotonia and failure to thrive. And this is chromosome seven and the software is telling us that we have a mosaic loss of chromosome seven in this infant. Uh, here is the little guy when he's three. Um, the initial workup of him was done um, when he was a newborn. He now, we know that he has a genesis of the corpus callosum um, and interhemispheric cysts as well as left cortical, uh, uh, left cortical heterotropia. Chromosomes were normal. We didn't see the loss of chromosome seven there, but on the microarray, we can pick up the uh, about 35% mosaicism. If you look closely at this, and I'm not sure you can see it, the log two ratio is actually up here where that little line is. And so we have a reduction uh, in the log two telling us that there is a, a deletion. If you look at the copy number state here, um, we are somewhere between one and two. And the allele calls tell us uh, that this is actually a uh, typical allele call for a mosaic deletion, um, but that's something that you have to look at a number of times. Uh, but it does tell us that there's something odd going on and we need to look at this closer. Um, we confirmed the loss by qPCR as well as by FISH. And when we gave the initial results to our clinician, um, we mentioned to him that in cytogenetics labs, when we see mosaic loss of chromosome seven, we think myelodysplasia. Uh, so he uh, sent this family immediately to a pediatric hemonc and they did a bone marrow biopsy, which found myelodysplastic cells with um, a loss of chromosome seven. By six months of age, he'd had a bone marrow transplant and uh, we were obviously the microarray enabled us for a timely intervention uh, for the management of this little guy's myelodysplasia. He's had annual biopsies performed since then and seems to be doing uh, well in terms of his myelodysplastic disease. Here we have a, another case of mosaicism and a finding of UPD that we then followed up with microsatellite analysis. So we found, uh, we had a sample come in um, from a seven week old male. We had failure to thrive. When we looked at the whole genome view, which is what this is up here, this is the log two ratio uh, of all of the chromosomes. You can see that chromosome 14 uh, is bumped up um, and actually it's 20% mosaic gain. When we looked at chromosome 14, you can see here that we have a 37 megabase region of absence of heterozygosity or loss of heterozygosity. So what we think happened in this little, for this little guy is that the conception was a trisomy and that we had trisomy rescue with the loss of this, in this particular case, this blue chromosome. And so most of the cells are, uh, have two copies, but we have that large region of um, loss of heterozygosity. How did we find out it was maternal? Well, that was when we did the microsatellite analysis. And you can see here, the microsatellite analysis gave us a number of markers that were definitely positive for, for maternal uniparental disomy. Uh, for those of you not used to looking at these, um, this is, I thought was very interesting. Here's our proband, here's our mom, here's our dad. Mom has two unique markers here. The proband has only one of those maternal markers. There is a little bit of a blip right here for one of the, the dads. And this I'm sure is the 20% uh, mosaic cells that have the extra chromosome. So we're seeing a little bit of dad's marker there. And on this marker, the proband has both of the maternal markers and 
uh, you can see a little bit here from one of the paternal markers. There are, remembering that chromosome 14 is an imprinted uh, chromosome, you can get maternal UPD causes Temple syndrome, paternal causes uh, Oga Ogami Ogata syndrome. This is a very severe uh, syndrome with very small thorax, a bell-shaped rib cage, very short limbs. Very few of these survive. The uh, Temple syndrome is much more like what we're seeing in our patient with IUGR and hypotonia. So the maternal uh, UPD it follows. Um, this was a more of an interest within the cytogenetics lab. We had a family, a three generation family with what we thought was an um, inverted 19. All of these 19s, so granddad, mom, and both of the boys look pretty much the same. So it was interesting. We thought something else might be going on in the boys to be causing their actually very significant um, problems. He has severe developmental delay and uh, very bad behavior disorder and seizures. The younger brother has also severe developmental delay and intellectual dis disability and autism. When we did the microarray on this case, um, we found that there was a deletion of the P-arm and a duplication of the Q-arm in chromosome 19, which follows with a rearrangement in the mom uh, of the inverted chromosome. So again, here's our inverted chromosome. And if we have, if we go back to your uh, meiosis and how we have crossing over and what happens with a, an inversion and what we ended up with was a derivative chromosome with an extra chunk of the Q arm and a small loss of the P arm, which we confirmed by fish. Um, here we have a normal, we had a normal exome uh, sequencing. This little nine-year-old girl has tuberous sclerosis. She has renal angiomyolipomas. She has uh, uh, hypomelanocytic macules that I think you can see here. She also has facial angiofibromas. And again, I think you can see them, but they're pretty small. They did focused exome sequencing of TSC1 and 2, and there were no variants found. We did a microarray and found a 703 KB loss that includes, here is TSC2. So it includes exons 1 through 15 of the TSC2 gene. Some relatively small findings, um, and I say relatively because this is 125 KB, so it's not that small. But this guy, this is a 13-year-old male. He has autism and seizures, and you can see the dysmorphic facies, uh, also relative macrocephaly. When we did this microarray, we found a 125 KB loss of 16Q24.3. This is another one of those newer microdeletion, microduplication syndromes. And uh, the, what's in the literature um, and in our patient are listed here in blue. Case eight is uh, this little guy is just as cute as can be. Um, he has microcephaly and ID, six-year-old, global developmental delay, 50 percentile for height and head circumference, uh, 97th percentile for weight, microcephaly, hypotonia. When we did his microarray, we found an 84 KB loss that included exons 8 through 11 of TRAPS-C9. If you, We went to the literature and... Um, found that uh, mutations in TRAPS-C9 uh, are associated with intellectual disability. They also have facial dysmorphisms. Again, what our patient has uh, that follows with what's in the literature is in blue, including obesity, hypotonia, and moderate ID. Uh, this is a, an extremely cool case. Um, of Wardenburg syndrome. We have now, just to back up a little bit, Wardenburg syndrome 
is a hearing loss syndrome with pigmentary changes in the hair, skin, and eyes. There are four forms of Wardenburg syndrome, and there are five genes that are involved with uh, Wardenburg syndrome. And this is an autosomal dominant disorder. Mom and dad both have Wardenburg. The uh, living child also has Wardenburg syndrome. Uh, they've had two pregnancy losses, both with what were termed arthrogryposis plus. Um, the second pregnancy loss is our proband here. And you can see this was a fetal loss at 32 weeks. Uh, white hair had uh, fixed limbs, scalp edema, micronapia, as well as a number of other uh, problems. The Wool uh, Wardenburg syndrome panel of sequencing panel that's done here at GGC, there were no findings. They then went to whole exome sequencing, and again, there were no findings. We did a microarray on this case and found about, this is a, approximately 100 KB deletion that includes SOX10. And SOX10 is one of the genes uh, that can cause Wardenburg. Uh, if you look at the end of this green arrow, you can see that there is a region where it appears that we have a homozygous deletion. So we decided to look more closely at the parents. We found that the mother was a carrier of the 100 KB deletion and that the father was a carrier of um, a much smaller deletion within SOX10. So this is a case where we have a homozygosity for a deletions with which include SOX10. Very cool case. And so the last case that I want to discuss before I end up is uh, where Sanger sequencing complicates microarrays um, or complicates, <laughs> um, complements microarray. So we have these two boys that are affected. You can see they have very similar habitus. They had had multiple clinical evaluations in multiple different locations across the country. The mother was very, very sure that there was obviously something wrong. The boys were regressing. They'd had multiple tests. All of those tests were normal, except one that was called out as inconclusive, and that was an oligosaccharide, and that is uh, something that should be remembered. She got frustrated. She had uh, SNPs run by 23andMe uh, from on both boys. She works at Texaco. She uh, took the data from 23andMe and had the regions that were the same between the boys picked out. And then she went through those regions and looked at every gene that she could find to try to find the gene that she felt was the cause. She came up with the AGA gene. About that time, um, she, they moved, the family moved to Charleston and saw one of our clinicians. We sequenced um, the AGA gene and found a single ex, a single mutation or a single change in exon three. It was not had not been yet reported in HGMD or other SNP databases, and but Polyfen and SIF had predicted this to be uh, pathogenic. But AGU is a recessive disorder, so we need another aberration. So we ran a microarray. And here we found a 34 KB deletion that includes exon 7 through 9 of the AGA gene. So we were able to find the second mutation. This family here is their uh, pedigree. Both boys got both the deletion and the exon 3 change. Dad's a carrier of the exon 3 change. Mom's a carrier of the deletion. Here you can see the qPCR, mom, child one, child two, and dad for the deletion. So AGU is a severe autosomal recessive lysosomal disorder. Um, the boys are getting progressively worse, and um, but at least they knew at that point uh, what was going on in the family. 
How do we follow up on microarrays? Uh, it very much depends on the type and size of the aberration and what the question is that, that you want to answer. So for instance, we did standard chromosome analysis as a follow-up on our girl with a duplication because we wanted to know where the extra pieces were and if we needed to be looking, um, thinking about reproductive things for the family. Uh, QPCR, we run QPCR on all of our, for all of our family information, uh, especially for the small CNVs. It's cost effective and it's fast. For uh, Sanger and NextGen sequencing, um, this should actually be reversed in that if they haven't been able to find a, a mutation in a, in a patient with an autosomal uh, dominant mutation, um, uh, we have, um, uh, I'm sorry, I just got mixed up here. So at any rate, for both of these, we're going to follow up. Sometimes we can find mutations for both AD and autosomal recessive disorders. And that can change the clinical management. And then methylation analysis for those places that uh, where we have segmental UPD or loss of heterozygosity. I'm almost done. So here, the overall conclusion of array analysis, it's a global visualization of genome. It, we can look for very much smaller deletions and duplications uh, than 10 megabases, which is all we can see on chromosome analysis. Uh, we can see copy number changes, duplications and deletions. Uh, it won't pick up balanced rearrangements except for regions of loss of heterozygosity. And in the last 10 years, we have identified many new deletion and duplication syndromes. Uh, routinely, we use this every day. Um, again, we run at least two, a run a week, if not two. The platforms that are available for clinical, uh, for clinical run changes are... Um, have different clinical sensitivities and uh, different utilities. Um, SNP microarrays allow for the detection of IBD and other UPDs, as well as help for recessive disorders. And we can use microarray as a complement for next-gen sequencing, as well as whole exome sequencing. And I want to give a big round of applause to my microarray lab, which uh, you can see here. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Barb. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today, so we're going to end it right there. Uh, we'd like to thank Barb DuPont and our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific. If we didn't have time to get to your question, we'll follow up with our experts. Uh, as a reminder, please look out for the pop-up survey after you log out to provide your feedback. If you missed any part of this webinar or wish to listen to it again, a link to an archived version will be emailed to all attendees. Thank you for joining us for this genome webinar.